This is Bible Academy. I'm pastor and teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue in the book of John, chapter 4. But before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we're controlled of the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and everything that you have provided so that we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and receptive to your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. In our last lesson, we were finishing up the account of Jesus, Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman. He had been teaching his disciples how important the will of God was that it was more important than anything else in life. We have a couple more verses to finish up, but let's first go back to pick up this last part of the story. We'll go back to 434. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say there are four months, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, that they are white for harvest. Even now, he who reaps is receiving reward and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the one who sows and the one who reaps can rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, that one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you did not work for. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, He told me all that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they began asking him to stay with them, and he remained there two days. And many more believed on account of his word. Well, we see here at the end of this that Jesus stayed there two more days. This is probably a time of intense teaching and questioning and answering. Learning on their part. After all, they had a lot to learn. You might even say a lot to unlearn, being Samaritans with their limited knowledge of Scripture. And notice there's a shift that goes on here in the comments from John. Verse 39 told us that many believe because of what the woman had said about Jesus. Then verse 41 says again, and many more believed on account of his word. So now they are listening to him, learning from him, believing what Jesus says, and beginning to apply it in their lives. They are moving towards and exercising saving faith. They believe what he says, they believe the word, and they're being saved. In verse 42, we get a confirmation that they had moved towards this position of saving faith. They were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is truly the Savior of the world. When John includes this in his writing, he's doing it for a purpose, to show his reading audience that these Samaritans had moved to the position in their faith. They acknowledged Jesus as the Savior. And this is a clear statement of confession that this Jesus is not only the Messiah, but they see him as the Savior, and notice, of the world. He came to save all. This is a very significant statement. Uh, this tells us that they had arrived in the kingdom of God. They moved from believing his word to believing him to be savior. Their faith goes to believing in who he was, and that's saving faith. Something much more than Nicodemus did, and that is somewhat of a contrast. Though Nicodemus eventually does come around, at this point in our story, he's lagging behind. John the Apostle, through his writing, 
has brought us from the Word becoming flesh, the God-man, the one and only Son of God, the Lamb of God, the one who brings the light to a darkened world, the one who offers living water, that is, eternal life, and now the Savior of the world. So if you're reading through John, you begin to build up this testimony of who Jesus is till you see these non-Jews, these Samaritans, claiming Jesus to be the Savior of the world. Another thing we should note is that Jesus and John the Baptist have moved out of their culture, out of the strict Jewish culture into the Samaritans, cross-cultural ministry as some would call it today even where some would be considered hostile they're willing to go there and spread the good news one more point to finish this section here's a good example of where people other than Jesus' own believed in him Now, as we come to verse 43, we begin a new section, a second miracle in Galilee. Verse 43. After the two days, he departed from there to Galilee. When the two days ended at Sukkar, or as we have seen it spelt Sychar, Jesus and his disciples go on up to Galilee. Let's put our map up here. They can continue the trip that they had began back in verse 3. So they're going to move up to Galilee. And as we look at the terrain here, I want you to notice how mountainous and how hilly it is. They're going to end up going over here to Cana. From Cana, they're going to go over to Capernaum, or actually this is where I should say the uh, the person who's going to see Jesus is from, Capernaum. So we again familiarize ourselves with these two places, Capernaum and Cana. So after two days, they go on up to Galilee, continue their trip that they had once started. Verse 44 where Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So right after this statement about them going up to Galilee, John inserts this parenthetical comment. Now there are two sides to this comment about what Jesus said. First, in the continuous pattern we have seen and will see regarding so many Jews both in Judea and Galilee, struggling to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, Jesus' own country is Judea and Galilee, the place of the Jews. And it's there, in those two places, that many have problems with Jesus. This is in accord with what John wrote earlier about Jesus not being received by his own. So that's one side of this statement. Remember, in Judea, there was Nicodemus and the Jewish authorities, and they showed little or no response to Jesus. The other side of this is that those in Samaria, not considered his home country, there is response. In fact, a great response, comparatively speaking. With this in mind, and Jesus moving back into Galilee, we can anticipate what is going to happen. Now, on another level, as Gentiles, Samaritans and Jews, as they read John's gospel, they for themselves can see that Jesus is trying to reach all of them. Gentiles, Samaritans, Jews. That he is the savior of the world, and he's gone out to save the world. It's also a pattern for us to see. There's no one people that we can witness to. So to sum up, 
Jesus' own people, the Jews, are generally not responsive, non-Jews. However, are more responsive. And that shows us that Jesus is out to save them all. That brings us to verse 45. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him because they had seen all the things he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. Parenthesis, for they themselves had gone to the feast. This is where an in-depth Bible study helps explain what's going on. I've given you some of the background already of what's going on. So let's look at this a little bit at a time. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. Now this appears to be a contradiction of what we just saw about Jesus not being honored in his own country. But it goes deeper than that. It's important to see the reason they welcomed Jesus. And that's in the second part of our verse. They were glad to see him, you might say, because they had seen all the things he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. They are not welcoming Jesus because he's the Messiah. They're welcoming him because they had heard and seen what he had done with those sign miracles. So they are probably hoping to see some more signs and wonders. They are attracted by the fascination of the miraculous. Keep that in mind. They're welcoming, they're welcoming him is based upon the opportunity they see that they might view him doing more miracles. So keep that in mind as we move to verse 46. Therefore he came to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. The royal official, there's been some question who this might be. <clears throat> uh, a good hint comes from the term that's used here in the text, basilikos. It has to do with something kingly. So we see this as a royal servant, some sort of official, which indicates he would have been a servant of the Tetrarch Herod. Now, sometimes Herod was called a king, though officially that was not his capacity. So this servant served Herod and probably was stationed in Capernaum. Now again, let's look at the map. <clears throat> Here's Cana, and you can notice to get to Capernaum, you had to cross through some of this hilly country, and there's a pretty good descent down to this area of the Lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, and there's Capernaum. In fact, the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, around this area is uh, some 700 feet below sea level. So you can see, here's the Mediterranean Sea up here, and you can just tell by this map practically three-dimensional that you can see how it descends down here so you went down to Capernaum literally if you were to go there uh, though this was only about 18 miles between Cana and Capernaum it was not an easy walk as you got into some of this hilly country well the official had heard of Jesus being in <clears throat> Cana and it apparently heard of his miracles and what he had done and what others were saying about him, uh, particularly in Jerusalem. At any rate, he's there in Canaan when Jesus shows up. When he heard that Jesus had come back, this is verse 47, from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was about to die. This royal official appears to have only one reason to come to Jesus. He wanted a miracle done on behalf of his son. He heard that Jesus could do him. His son was about to die, 
and he thought that Jesus might heal him if he could persuade him to act on his behalf. Now, there's a lesson here. Let's look at it. Verse 48, Jesus said to him, So Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. Now, this may sound kind of harsh to somebody asking to have his son healed, but notice the word you. Uh, I put in the word people because I'm trying to indicate this is a plural. This is a plural. So Jesus is addressing the crowd, not just him, but it appears that Jesus takes off of what this official had said regarding his son wanting a miracle to make this statement. So he's not just speaking to the official, but to all who have gathered to see Jesus do another sign miracle. Uh, as I said, this may sound harsh, but the fact is Jesus can heal his son, but if he and his father do not trust Jesus as the Savior Messiah, then they still stand condemned. You know, people often ask us for help as Christians. They may need food or financial help or something else. Uh, I'm not saying to withhold it from them. I'm not saying to give it to them. That's really a judgment call on your part. But whatever you do for the unbeliever, unless they turn to Christ, they still are condemned. And let's keep that in mind. Well, the first thing we should see in Jesus' response is that he's saying that they needed to see something to respond to more than just miracles. They needed to respond to Jesus by faith. The problem with this kind of acceptance of Jesus is that, first of all, it's not saving faith. Now, there's lots of ways we could put it, depending on one's attitude. <clears throat> He could be just looking for some sort of entertainment or some thrill. Or really say, boy, this is really from God. But that still doesn't save them. The problem with this kind of uh, acceptance of Jesus, you might even say they believe that Jesus could do these miracles. So there's a, there's a, a faith there. It's not motivated by a the kind of faith that one needs to be saved. It's a shallow faith at best. There's, co there's no commitment there. There's no believing in the person and work of Christ. Now, Christ hadn't went to the cross yet. <clears throat> but what information has been revealed about him, that he's the Savior, that he's the Messiah, he's the Son of God, they could believe that and move into the kingdom of God. Now, this kind of faith they have regarding he could do miracles could lead to a deeper faith, but not often. In fact, it's often somewhat of a blockage, you might say, to genuine faith because the person has got his mind set on being entertained or getting a thrill or being able to tell, being able to tell somebody, I was there. And that's the point we need to see here. More than just the Father being addressed when Jesus says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. So Jesus is trying to get these people off of this attitude of just wanting to see signs and wonders. They should want to know who Jesus really is and what he's there for and listen to what he has to say. Notice they don't say, oh, let's hear what he has to say to us. No, they're ready to see him do something else. So they can witness it. They can run home and tell their friends and family, let me tell you what Jesus did this time. So see, they're not even on the same frequency that one needs to be to be saved. They may accept these works that Jesus does as acts of God. They can believe that Jesus was from God, but they were missing believing what he had to say about the kingdom. So there's a lack of commitment and trusting their entire spiritual welfare in the hands of Jesus. So 
let's just write this down shallow faith it looks for signs and wonders it thrives on that type of thing uh, people today in your charismatic churches if they if they think they're around signs and wonders that means they're closer to God and it makes them feel good it gets them excited they get all thrilled they start jumping up and down they start speaking in their phony tongues and they think that they are worshiping God and they're completely misled. But this type of shallow faith lacks something and we're going to look at faith pretty close in this lesson because there's some good contrast here. These are those who just believe Jesus to the point that they realize he fascinates them with his signs and wonders. These are the ones Jesus is addressing when he says, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. So they got signs and wonders first, not Jesus, and who he is and what he's there for. Now the official. He's heard about the signs and wonders, but he's got a different attitude than they do. Yes, he wants a signed miracle to heal his dying son, but at the same time, within him, he is beginning to understand that Jesus is more than someone who just does signs and wonders. And we don't see that indicated yet, but that will come out later in the story. Now listen. This account gives us some key insights into faith. How faith operates, the different types of faith. The official responds to Jesus by saying, The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. This official would not have uh, come to see Jesus unless he thought that Jesus could miraculously heal him, uh, heal his son. So there's some faith in the person of Jesus, and he has the ability to heal his son. So there is faith there. In verse 50, we see the issues of faith, miracles, and response come together. Jesus said to him, Go home, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and departed. Now notice, the man didn't see a miracle, but he believed Jesus. That's a step closer to genuine faith. Because once you start believing the words of Jesus and you hear he's the Savior and he's the Messiah, then you're moving to saving faith. Well, when he says, Jesus said, go home, your son lives, Jesus as the God-man, as God in his omnipotence, acted on behalf of this man. Jesus gives him the opportunity to take a step forward in his faith and believe what he's going to tell him. Look at the last part of verse 50 again. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and departed. He went back to Capernaum. Again, let's understand, this official, this official has not seen a miracle, but he took Jesus for what he said, his word. He believed in Jesus that he was capable of healing his son. Sometimes there's a danger of charting things out. But let's do this one. We'll take the risk. Even today, when we hear someone speak, we associate that person's integrity, his personality, who he is, with what he says. All right? This official, he believed. Jesus by what Jesus said. Now that's a good thing. That's a step forward. 
he has not seen a miracle, but he believes Jesus. So he at least believes that Jesus has the ability that Jesus is going to do what he says. So he acts upon this. And I must say, though it's not mentioned in the text, this is something we need to realize when we witness the people. If the Holy Spirit is working on somebody's heart, convicting them, that's what's going to really move them as they respond to the Spirit making these things a reality in the heart. And that's a heart issue. Now, we've examined the heart issue in a number of passages over the last few years. But this man's heart is turning towards Christ in the right way. His belief is acted out, and that he not only believed what Jesus said, but he started back home, believing that when Jesus said, your son lives, that's a way of saying, he's going to make it. He's going to recover. This man exercised faith towards Jesus by this word that Jesus told him. Now, we're going to see that he's just about there at saving faith. Notice he received the word. He believed it. And he applied it. He applied it by going to see his son, which is what a father would do when he hears his son's been healed. This is active faith. Active faith. This shows us that the seed is getting set in the soil. There's some depth, and he's acting on it. Now here's where we learn more about faith. This official with the sick son responds by faith to the words and he's going to see the works of Jesus. He has not fully believed in the person of Jesus Christ, that he's the Messiah, that he's the Son of God, the Savior of the world, but he's probably heard that that's what they're calling him, at least some calling him, and he's on the right path. He's not denying Jesus. He's not rejecting Jesus. He's not saying he can't do this. In fact, he believes he can do this. So, he's on his way home now. Let's look at our map again. He's traveling back from Cana, on the way back, down to Capernaum. All right? For most, this would take more than one day. You can walk 20 miles in a day. It's not easy. Uh, but if, if it's straight and level, you can do that. A lot of people can. But now we're talking hilly country, hilly terrain. That's different. Up and down and up and down. Maybe not such a smooth path. Usually that would take a couple of days. So it's more challenging. Well, he's on his way down there when he learns that his son is recovering. He gets the good news even before he arrives, he arrives at home. Verse 51. While he was on his way down, his servants met him, saying that his son was going to live. Again, this tells us he's on his way down to Capernaum, down to that area uh, below sea level his servants now this is something that we might struggle with in the United States and other parts of the world but these are slaves uh, probably uh, men who had sold themselves into slavery to pay off a debt or for some other reason they were owned by the official they put themselves in that position, most likely. Uh, maybe they could have been a prisoner of war who just decided to stay in that good position. It's better than being executed or thrown into prison or sent back somewhere. We would normally call these men bond servants. They're under a bond to their master. Anyway, his servants met him with this good news. The reason I went off that for a moment because people confuse servants 
as the way we use them today and compared to slaves, but slaves, he was, they were owned by him. So let's keep that in mind. But they served him at the same time. So we could say slave-servant, but that's not really something we say very often. But they tell him that his son was going to live. So his big question, and I think this would be a lot of our, our question too, the same question. Verse 52, so he asked them the hour in which he got better. Then they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the official wanted to know for sure if Jesus' words had cured his son. So we see he thought it would happen, and he wants to know for sure. They said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The seventh hour, Jewish time, 1 p.m. our time, a Roman time. This was the confirmation the official needed. He knew that Jesus kept his word, and his faith took another step forward. Verse 53, or we might say the seed went deeper. Verse 53, so the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives, and he himself believed and his entire household. That's all he needed to take him over to saving faith. Now he was totally convinced that Jesus is who, now listen, he was totally convinced that Jesus was who he said he was. He proved it by his works. Remember that sign miracles were a way that authenticated the speaker. Same way with the apostles. Same way with Jesus. His claims are true. God is behind him. His message is true. What they've been saying about Jesus, that he's the Savior of the world, that he's the Messiah, that he's the, the hope they've been waiting for for centuries. He has arrived, and the official was convinced. And he himself believed in his entire household. The seed went deep. The news that his son started to heal at the same time Jesus had said he would live confirmed his faith so much so that his entire household became believers. I expect if we fill in the details, we would see something like the official told his family, his servants, his entire household what had happened back in Cana, and now they can all witness that this happened at the same time, his healing happened at the same time that Jesus pronounced those words. It was often the case that the father, the patriarch of the family, would lead the way in faith in a family and the household, and that's what happened here. John notes for us, Verse 54, this is again a second sign that Jesus did when he come out of Judea into Galilee. Now, this is just telling us that this is the second miracle that's recorded that we have that took place in Galilee. The first one, of course, was the wedding at Cana when he changed the water into wine. Now we're going to look at faith a little closer, but first I want you to see the pattern here. A pattern that Jesus will teach later. First of all, I mentioned this earlier regarding the cross-cultural aspect of Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist's ministry. The gospel goes from Judea to Galilee. Oops. I should have put it this way. Hold on. It goes from Judea, which is, I'm going to put it this way, Jerusalem. All right. It goes to Samaria. And then it goes up to Galilee. 
Jesus had started spreading the good news to the world. And this is what his disciples will learn to do. The gospel is for all. This is where they could travel. This is the area they're familiar with. And these are the people they're familiar with. These are the ones they're going to go to. Samaritans are the exception, of course. They even got to go to people that's normally hostile to Jews or vice versa. But Jesus is setting the pattern for spreading the gospel. Now let's talk about an issue here in our text I want us to bring up and get some clarity on. We learned in the last few, few lessons what saving faith is. Saving faith is a continuous belief in Jesus. In his person, who he is, he's the God-man. We could add he's the Son of God, he's the second person of the Trinity. His work was on the cross. He died spiritually on our behalf. Uh, substitutionary atonement is the long terms. But he died for us. So he's on the cross where he died spiritually. The Father forsook him. He received the penalty of our sins on the cross. So he died. He was buried the tomb for three days not full not a full three days but in their way of counting days a partial day was a day so he was buried and then he resurrected all essential parts of the gospel the object now as I said earlier and I'm going to depart from our story for a moment these elements here aren't in the gospel yet. They will come, so they will believe them later, those who continue to believe in Jesus. All right? You could just add these on. This is our gospel today, and that's what I want to focus on, our gospel today. At the point in our story, saving faith is believing what Jesus had revealed of himself. The death, burial, and resurrection have not occurred yet, but when they do, it's believing that also. Now, that's not really complicated, but there are a lot of those people out there who don't understand this, and they don't even understand the difference between a saving faith and a shallow faith. So let's talk about those two again and contrast them. Our text, <clears throat> today's lesson, gave us a good example of shallow faith. Now what I mean by this is there is some believing. For example, uh, in our particular lesson, many believed Jesus could do the signs and wonders. So when he came into town, that's really what they're looking for. They believe Jesus is doing it. Uh, some may believe that he's doing it in God's power. But it's not saving faith. But I must say, it can be a start. It can be. It can be a step forward, but it could go either way. It could go towards saving faith. Or, let me just put over here, or not saving faith. If we were to compare this to the levels of faith in the parables of the soil, this would be the rocky soil. All right? Do you remember the parable of the soil? The rocky soil, the seed um, lands on rocky soil. 
it's what I would call more of a reactionary faith. There's no firm root. But what happens is that people believe for a while and fall away. They're not moving in the direction to be solidified in their faith. The seed doesn't go down deep. And it's a beautiful illustration. It just illustrates that people can believe for a short time and then fall away. Now that would sound scary to some who don't have a deep faith. Then I would just challenge them to ask them, why don't you? It's a matter of decision. It's a matter of believing. It's a matter of committing yourself to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Not just as someone you associate with as someone who's going to save you. You need to recognize that you're a sinner and turn to him wholeheartedly in faith and continue to believe in him. And then your faith moves into a continuous belief. And you maintain that faith daily taking in the word, believing God's word. That's just a way of maintaining it. It's not a work system, but if you don't show and demonstrate from your saving faith that you love the word, you want to be obedient, uh, you want to deepen your faith and grow spiritually, then you're in danger of your faith getting shallow again. It's all a matter of choice. You choose to believe continuously. Now, let me show you something that is probably one of the more popular teachings among evangelicals. Basically, we're in the evangelical camp. We believe that salvation is by faith, that Jesus is the God-man, that there's a trinity, the Bible's inspired, and so on. But many believe that you have one single act of faith, and then Christ. That's true. You do believe in Christ, the one single act of faith. And then they believe that you do not have to maintain your faith that you are instantly entered into the family of God. Now, that's true. You are entered into the family of God also. But there are many who think that just one single act of faith can keep one saved. The problem with that is, what if you decide not to believe anymore? There are a large number of evangelicals who say that can't happen. If that happened, then you weren't really saved. And yet there's no scripture to support that. Plenty of scripture that teaches that we can fall away. Believers can fall away. So, what I'm saying is there are some who think that one single act of faith in Christ, maybe as a five-year-old child, and then as that child grows up, he shows nothing of being a Christian. They, oh, he was saved when he was a kid. He's going to be in heaven someday. Or they'll say that about an adult who says they trusted in Christ, but yet there's absolutely no evidence of it. But they had that one experience, and they assume that that person is saved. Well, we don't know what's going on in a person's heart. But faith needs to be continuous. And I think it's quite simple by just saying he's a believer. If he's a believer, he continues to believe. It's that simple. If he does not continue to believe, he becomes an unbeliever. And even the simple terminology in the Greek teaches that. Though theology, in many circles, theology has twisted this to something else. Now, once you become a believer and you've gone on that road to uh, 
continuous faith, and you're saved. All right? It happens at the moment you believe Jesus Christ, as I said a moment ago, in these elements of the gospel. And you continue to believe that. Now, that's not hard. You're already there. But, as we see in the parables of the soil, if it's rocky soil, there's a real temptation to fall away. The temptation rather comes in the distractions of the world. Uh, many people uh, respond emotionally, and there's faith there. But when the emotion dies down, the faith fades away. Now let's contrast this with saving faith. I showed you, showed you the elements of it earlier. <clears throat> it's based on believing Jesus in the day of in his time Jesus as the Messiah we would say Jesus as the Christ he's the Savior um, using today's uh, terminology today's time he's the king this is believing who Jesus is all right he's the God man this is all believing his person. His works, again, he goes to the cross, dies for our sin in our place, substitutionary atonement. He's buried. That's an important element of the gospel. He did die physically. He had to die physically to be resurrected. So that's an important part of the gospel. You need to understand he did die physically as a human uh, his body uh, went to the grave. It was kaput. And then the spirit returns. The, re the body is rejuvenated. It's transformed. The transformation that we'll go through if we're on earth when Jesus comes back. And he was given his resurrection body. His eternal bo body. Now, that is the difference. This is the believing in the person of, of Christ and his work. All right? And this is a continuous faith. Again, I'd refer you back to the parable of the soils. Now, we see this official. Now, we don't see these last three elements of the gospel. Remember that, the, the uh, final works of Christ on, on earth. But we see this official going through what we might call stages of faith. Let's look at them for a moment. Because there are similarities in what we'll see in people today. Uh, you know, and each person, as we saw in an earlier lesson, can be a participant in being a sower of these stages of faith. First, he comes, into he comes in response to thinking Jesus can heal his son because of hearing that he can do miracles. And this is a shallow faith. Now what I'm describing is the official all right, we see the stages he went through. He came because Jesus, he had heard Jesus had, could do miracles. Uh, this is rocky soil. He could go either way, remember? He could go either way. Second, watch what happens. He believes Jesus' words. He's starting to go this way. Okay? He believes his son's going to be healed, and he acts upon it. That's why he left. He's not fully arrived yet, because, he, because we see him question as to when his son was healed. And that's no accident that uh, John records that for us. He still had some lingering doubt. 
All right. Third, once he hears that Jesus' words came true, he is now convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. So that would be what he would be telling his family, his household. That his words were true, he is to Christ. He believed in his person, and that is saving faith. So he believed in his person. Now that would include the fact that he's a savior, though they haven't seen all of that happen yet. That's as far as he could go at that point. And we see this confirmed further when it says he and his, his household believed. Like I said, he probably witnessed to his household what he knew of Jesus, what he had said. He, he, he would fill in the story just like we would witness to someone today, perhaps about our, our conversion. But they saw the son recovered. Their stories agreed. They received the word from him, believed it, and were saved also. So what we should gather from this is uh, there can be a shallow faith and there can be a saving faith. Now there are a couple of other different types of faith. We saw that in the parable of the soils, but I just want to show you this contrast. Um, if you go back and look at the parable of the so soils for a moment, let me sum them up for you. Now, these aren't necessarily the stages of faith, but these are different types of faith people can have that Jesus describes. The seed falls first, the first stage, or well, not stage, excuse me, erase that. The first kind of faith, the seed falls on the side of the road. The devil takes it away, and the person's not saved. Clearly, that person's not saved. The rocky soil, he receives it with joy, but there's no firm root. The leaves for a while and a time of temptation will fall away. That's a shallow faith. There's a real potential of falling away. And, and this is what usually happens with people who uh, take the seed for the wrong reason. This would be those who take the seed because of signs and wonders. Then there's the seed that falls among the thorns, choked with worries and riches, pleasures, and they do not bring fruit to maturity. Now, this person may become a believer, but he is neutralized because he can't get his eyes off the world and its pleasures and its riches and its worries. So he remains immature. This is probably most believers. They go to a Baptist church. They hear the gospel. They trust in Christ. They always see him as their Lord and Savior. They understand that he died for their sins, that he was buried and resurrected, and they are saved. But their minds and hearts get so full of the world, they can't get serious. And so they gather in a church where there are many like-minded, and that's the way they stay the rest of their life. And then there's the good soul. The seed falls in the good soil where there's an honest and good heart, and notice this is what gets it deep and honest a good heart. You're honest before God. Your heart is good before God. You hold fast and bear fruit for perseverance. That is, you hold fast your faith and it deepens and it grows and there is fruit. This is where we all want to be. This is where we want those we witness to to be. Well, we'll continue here in our next lesson. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word, your truth, and many blessings we've derived from it today. Challenge us in having a better understanding of faith that we might not only be better witnesses, but for ourselves that we will deepen our faith and grow spiritually. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.